Welcome to the webinar, Practical Steps Towards Diversifying Collections. I am Shannon Stenberg, and with us today is moderator Elizabeth McKinney, Director of the Library for Roanoke College and OCLC America's Regional Council Member, Summer Durant, Collection Services Librarian and University of Mary Washington, Curtis Kendrick, Dean of Libraries at Binghamton University, Helen McManus, Head of Collection Strategy at George Mason University, and Shayla Scott Weber, Senior Program Officer, OCLC Research Library Partnership. In just a moment, I will turn things over to Elizabeth, but we want to begin today's presentation with a land virtual acknowledgement. This presents a challenge as we are all, both speakers and attendees, in different places, and the technology we use similarly flows over and across a multitude of landscapes. I am speaking to you from our OCLC headquarters, which is located in the Scioto River Corridor, an important locus for trade and transportation. This is the land of the Shawnee, Wyandotte, Delaware, and Mingo people who are still with us today, as well as the more ancient Hopewell and Adena cultures. Consider the place where your feet touched the ground when you got out of bed this morning and consider your relationship to that space. We express gratitude towards those who have been here before us and seek to learn more in paying respects to and honoring these people. And we invite you to join with us in reflection, knowledge seeking and appreciation. I'm going to pause for just a moment and then I will pass things over to Elizabeth. Thank you and welcome Elizabeth. Good afternoon and thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us today for today's panel discussion, Practical Steps Towards Diversifying Collections. I'm Elizabeth McClenney, Director of Fintel Library for Roanoke College. For many organizations, efforts are underway to support diverse library and archival collections that better serve and reflect traditionally underrepresented communities. Sometimes that involves providing materials that serve more inclusive needs. Other times, it can include hosting content by more diverse creators. In either case, as we all know, doing the work requires more than just good intentions. Our panelists today will talk, will each talk a bit about their own projects, and then we'll discuss together some of the implications and suggestions. Helen McManus, Head of Collection Strategy at George Mason University, and Summer Durant, Collection Services Librarian at the University of Mary Washington, will discuss a project they are working on in collaboration with VIVA, Virginia, Virginia's Academic Library Consortium, to incorporate EDI metrics into an existing value metric tool, which is used to assess subscription-based electronic resources. They will describe the new EDI metrics as well as how the updated value metrics is being used at the consortial and institutional levels. Then Chayla Scott Weber, a senior program officer with the OCLC Research Library Partnership, will introduce her latest research and toolkit for examining the total cost of stewardship for special collections. Her work touches on the importance of thinking holistically about special collections, especially in terms of planning for the success of collections that represent diverse communities. Finally, Curtis Kendrick, Dean of Libraries, Binghamton University, will speak about why diversity does not equal anti-racism and the political realities of trying to mitigate manifestations of systemic racism in our collections and libraries. What are the implications of on campus of the library providing leadership for the university in this area? But before we get started, I want to take the temperature of our audience and lead off with a quick visual poll. For the question, how prepared do you feel to work on diversifying your institution collections? Indicate where you stand, somewhere in between from not at all to I've got everything I need. How prepared do you feel to work on diversifying your institution collections? All right, so how are we doing with that poll? So we have a wide disperse on this on the color chart, as you can see. 
Uh, majority of us seem to be hovering somewhere in the middle, which is a good thing. And there are a few of us that are experts at this. And there are some of us that are going to benefit from this conversation that we're having today. So thank you everyone uh, for participating. I'm going to start off uh, the, the conversation this afternoon and tell you a bit about some of my re the related activities at my institution. First, thank you to OCLC for this wonderful forum. The sheer numbers registered demonstrate the interest in this topic. And I'm going to preface my confidence by saying the efforts that we're undertaking here at Roanoke College are truly rooted in practicality. Roanoke is a small private liberal arts institution in Southwest Virginia with just under 2,000 students. DEI initiatives have been underway for some time at the college, spread among different units. This summer, the college hired its first VP for community diversity and inclusion. In the hiring of this position, we are now looking forward to a centralized approach to DEI and enhanced communication throughout the college regarding DEI efforts. Fintel Library is a member of VIVA, the Virtual Library of Virginia, and you'll hear about the DEI initiatives in a moment. Fintel also shares a collection and resource management system with our neighboring institution about 15 minutes down the street, Hollins University. Hollins and RC students and faculty and staff have almost immediate access to physical resources with one another's collections, either as walk-in users or by requesting items through our daily courier. As part of our interlibrary arrangement, we try not to duplicate holdings for resources, and this comes into a play in a little later in some of my remarks. When I think about the heat map poll, our library is probably a little left of center in how prepared we feel to work on diversifying collections. We began small and add to our efforts each year. The library's first intentional foray into diversifying its collections actually began with implementation of the institutional repository in 2015. The project created an opportunity for collaboration with new history faculty to document LGBTQ plus life in Southwest Virginia. The resulting collections lives within the open access community collections on the JSTOR platform. And this was a crowdsource project, so it also made it a community-based effort. Of other of our efforts have been linked directly to campus initiatives and programming, as I'm sure many of you have also done. For example, the library has a convening space, our collaboration space, and its learning commons, which can be used for both formal and informal gatherings. We deliberately worked with the Director of Multicultural Affairs to host diversity dine-ins in that space. And there, are the host of other campus and in that space also are a host of other campus program topics on DEI and civil discourse. Many of our resource displays have been created in support of the divine and topics and or campus speakers. The benefit is that these collections gave the library an opportunity to enhance collecting areas and improve access to resources. The displays had been physical, but then the pandemic hit and we made them virtual too. Another initiative that began in somewhat un a unique way was with our education department. It expressed a desire for us to work with our, their students to develop culturally inclusive collections. Students initially, as part of their uh, education assignment, collected resources uh, for their dream library and then began comparing them against Fentel's collection. The results were actually rather surprising for us. We may have owned approximately half the titles in those dream collections directly, or we relied upon Holland's collections to fulfill juvenile collection needs. So we relied upon Holland's uh, to fulfill the collection needs. But what this did actually for us was create a gap in what we held directly. And so it was an unintentional gap because we were trying to mitigate other circumstances in terms of equitable use of funding. But our education faculty strongly believe that students should be able to have diverse materials on site as well as uh, having access to materials at Hollands and those that we already had in the collection. And we're making progress in closing those gaps with gift and operational funds to address collecting gaps. As we've progressed in our efforts, what has become crystal clear for us that in order to be successful, we not just have to, we not only have to ask 
or act with practicality, but we must be intentional in our efforts. So this is something that I think we teach our education students. We're teaching ourselves. And I hope that um, you can take something away from the comments that I've made. Now I'm going to turn it over to Helen and Summer, who will describe the new EDI metrics, as well as how the updated value metric tool is being used at consortial levels. Helen and Summer. Thank you, Elizabeth. As libraries think about what equity, diversity, and inclusion might mean for collection development, Part of this is rethinking how to assess collections. Summer and I are going to talk about our work with Viva, Virginia's Academic Library Consortium, on this aspect of diversifying collections. Viva is a consortium of 71 academic libraries in Virginia, and it provides a core shared collection of e-resources for public institutions from community colleges to R1s. In the sense of leveling the playing field, for students across Virginia, equity has always been core to, Virgin to Viva's mission. And uh, this has taken on new meaning amid ongoing conversations about anti-racism and equity, diversity, and inclusion. Back in 2016, Viva developed a tool for evaluating e-resources holistically, going beyond usage and cost per use. Um, it's called the Value Metric. And last year, Viva formed a working group to revise this tool to really center consortial values. The main focus of the group has been to make sure that equity, diversity, and inclusion are not treated as a separate or other um, section, but they are incorporated throughout the broad categories of the value metric, um, including alignment with curriculum, user experience, and Viva values. The group met with a variety of stakeholders to better understand what it means to approach collections with equity, diversity, and inclusion in mind. These conversations helped us learn about how different groups are either thinking about barriers to equity and inclusion or approaching making resources more equitable and inclusive. The result of these conversations are metrics that challenge us to think about equity in collections from a few perspectives. EDI content asks, does this resource contribute to making our collections, collections more re representative? Does it include content by or about historically oppressed voices, experiences, identities, and communities? EDI engagement asks, is there a demonstrable commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion from publishers and vendors? For example, are people with diverse identities and experiences included at all levels of an organization? Are collections by or about historically excluded communities created, organized, and described in collaboration with those communities? So a third area of focus is accessibility, which we take to be a critical element of inclusion. And this examines whether the platform and content are accessible to all users. There is one metric that looks specifically at the platform and is rated using Library Accessibility Alliance evaluation and the WAVE Web Accessibility Evaluation Tool. And then there are several format-specific metrics, such as whether streaming videos have closed captioning, transcripts, and audio descriptions. The value metric also has elements that include support for bibliodiversity and open access. So overall, the new metrics are meant to reflect how critical it is to the Viva community that we and our vendors are deeply engaged in EDI and anti-racist work and that this will be measured alongside factors such as usage and sustainable pricing when products are evaluated. The updated value metric can be adapted for use at both the consortial and the institutional level. The University of Mary Washington adapted the original tool last year, revising a number of the metrics to reflect the goals and values of a single institution. So we evaluated 61 products during the 2019-2020 academic year. And if you're interested in learning more about that process and the local metrics that were used, we recently published an article in the journal Collection Management. UMW is in the process of revising its local adaptation to incorporate the new EDI metrics, again, in a way that's tailored to our institution's approach to these values. Almost a year into the process of revising the value metric tool, we still have a number of steps to take. So first we need to finish scoring all the Viva shared products. 
we tested the revised metrics on a handful of products and are now ready to score all of them. We plan to review the results to ensure that the metrics do meaningfully get at equity, diversity, and inclusion, as we as the, and the groups that we've consulted along the way would hope. And if needed, we will further refine the metrics and our scoring documentation. And finally, we plan to send a request for information to vendors to standardize how we gather information on their EDI and OA initiatives, which is needed for scoring some of the metrics. So in conclusion, our hope is that this revised e-resource assessment tool will prompt us to think more critically about different ways our funds need to be prioritized and to make actual changes to our shared e-resource collections so that VIVA provides a core collection in which all students and faculty at all member institutions, especially those from historically underrepresented groups, can find their experiences and identities affirmed. So thank you very much, and I will go ahead and turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Helen and Summer. Now, Shayla, tell us about your recent OCLC research report and tools around the idea of the total cost of stewardship for special collections and how that relates to diversity efforts. Um, so, hi, I'm Shayla Scott Weber. I'm a senior program officer with OCLC's Research Library Partnership. Um, I am here today to talk to you about some recent work of the partnership, our total cost of stewardship framework and tool suite. Um, the framework and tools can be used to examine and alter the way special collection staff make decisions about collection building. And while it was created with special collections in mind, there's a, there is much within the tools and framework that I think is relevant to broader library collections. Um, today, I'll focus on how they can be used to support efforts to diversify collections. This work was created by a group of colleagues across many different special collections within the RLP, and I want to take I want to credit and uplift the efforts of everyone you see on this slide. So I'd like to start with these two foundational assumptions that are a core to the rest of my presentation. The first is that white supremacy is systemic. In a 1989 article in Cornell Law Review, Ansley defines white supremacy as a political, economic, and cultural system in which whites overwhelmingly control power and material resources. Conscious and unconscious ideas of white superiority and entitlement are widespread. And relations of white dominance and non-white subordination are daily reenacted across a broad array of institutions and social settings. This definition reminds us of the deep systemic nature of white supremacy but also the key modes in which it's enacted and upheld. Which brings us to the second foundational idea, that doing things the way we've always done them upholds a status quo of white supremacy. That status quo is operationalized and reenacted in our institutions via policy and administrative mechanisms throughout our work. And collection building is no different. We build collections one decision at a time, relying on routine policies and workflows. And if we don't intervene in those routines, we'll just collect more of the same. In libraries with archives and special collections, we see lots of project-based work, uh, efforts to rectify the lack of diversity in our collections, often via outreach to and documentation of specific communities. And while these projects can be excellent, discrete projects aren't enough. Diversifying collections into the future requires thorough and thoughtful examination and intentional alteration of established collection building workflows. Asking what is the composition of our current collection? How are our collection decisions made? By whom and with, with, with what information? And how do we want that to change? The total cost of stewardship framework can be used to examine and intervene in those current collecting workflows. Um, this work is centered on the understanding that research libraries and cultural heritage institutions hold their archives and special collections in trust for the public and commit to providing broad and equitable access to rare and unique collections. So for these collections to be truly valuable, they must be available for use. In this light, descriptive backlogs are a potential breach of trust. They can hurt relationships with donors and creators of collections, and keep material from being equitably used by researchers. 
With this in mind, we offer up the idea of total cost of stewardship to consider the full resources necessary to care for, for a special collections acquisition. It borrows from the idea of total cost of ownership, but adds an ethical layer that goes beyond ownership to stewardship. And so we define total cost of stewardship as all of the costs associated with building, managing, and caring for collections so that they can be used by and useful to the public. So this acknowledges that responsible collecting does not stop at acquisition, but considers all of the activities that are necessary to make collections accessible and deliver on our promises to donors and creators and those whom the collections document. The total cost of stewardship framework operationalizes these ideas. It's a model of working that brings information and people together to consider the value of a potential acquisition and its alignment with institutional goals alongside the cost and skills necessary to acquire, care for, and manage it. There are four elements to the framework. It starts with documenting collecting priorities and then focuses effort on determining institutional capacity for stewardship and then moves on to gathering and sharing information about both a potential acquisition and the institutional capacity to care for it and then ultimately bringing that information and people together to make decisions together. Uh, the framework is, suppo is supported by a set of practical tools, which you see listed under each phase here. Uh, they are communication templates and cost and capacity estimators, all of which prompt consideration of how a potential collection might line up with mission and goals, including goals around diversifying collections. There are finite resources available to purchase and preserve and describe and make available new collections. The framework can help ensure that allocations of these resources align with stated mission and values and priorities, and that with each decision we make, we're considering these goals, if and how a collection furthers them, as well as how taking in one collection might impact institutional ability to take in and care for other collections. So making these kinds of changes in practice requires patience and commitment and a truly concerted effort, uh, but a framework can help guide success. Um, you can download the report and the tool suite, as well as tutorial videos and other supporting documentation at this link, which I'll also drop into chat. Thank you. Thanks, Jayla. Now, Curtis, your thoughts on libraries providing leadership in this area and some of the, as you said, political realities. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you all for, uh, for coming today. I'm delighted to be here. So, you know, we were asked to speak on practical steps towards diversifying collections. And um, I hope uh, not to disappoint, but I'm actually less interested in diversifying our collections than I am in, in making them less racist. We have to do both, but they are not the same thing. And there may be different implications on, on campus. And, and my practical steps may have more to do with the political realities of trying to affect change within the larger organizational entity of a college or university. So first on diversity, to me, Diversity can mean just about anything anyone wants it to mean. While racism is very explicit, it's clear what is under discussion. We in libraries have lots of conversations about diversity and too few about racism, so fundamental problems never get addressed. For one, when we were talking about race, we were talking about power and power relationships and long histories of subjugation and oppression. Diversity is much more fun. We get to celebrate diversity like a, like a big party. People get nervous, though, when we start talking about racial celebrations. It's also easier to talk about diversity than it is to talk about race, because to talk about race in libraries, I mean, where do you even start? Collections? Most academic library collections in the US like the academic libraries themselves and their parent organizations are dominated by a white perspective and worldview that permeates virtually every corner of the culture in which we live. And since our past library collection building practices have resulted in collections containing a preponderance of white authors writing about the white experience, 
we risk alienating an increasing portion of our potential user population who may feel the library is not for them. But what are the implications of actually changing the status quo as it is probably working for a lot of people? How do we factor in reactions to our work and potential responses or resistance to any changes our work brings about? The library may be all ready to confront systemic racism, but is the rest of the college or university on board with that? Just in general, as we've seen from the backlash against teaching critical race theory to second graders, there are people who find any kind of discussion related to racial matters threatening, and their response is to try to curtail the conversation. So fast forward to the conclusion of your audit, and for argument's sake, one recommendation is to earmark 20% of the collection's budget towards making the collection more anti-racist. Well, that sounds good, but where are the funds going to come from? Is the provost on board with the entire initiative? In spite of what they may tell you, it pretty much is a zero-sum game. So if the money is going towards diversifying the library, it's not going someplace else. How will the mathematics department feel when the library slashes their allocation to purchase a bunch of books on Black Lives Matter? Conversely, the process of the audit represents an excellent opportunity for the library to provide leadership for the university in this area and to connect with other social justice advocates on campus and extend that community. As an administrative entity within the university, the library has a lot of power and authority by its mere existence. Just the power alone to convene a group for a conversation is significant. Beyond convening groups, there is the potential for the library to drive a discussion about curriculum change on campus. We can take our collection development efforts to the next level under the banner of a library-led campus-wide pluralism or diversity initiative. It's just the library promoting books. How radical can that possibly be? At Binghamton, uh, we've been working on a collections audit project to look at individually purchased book titles, both print and digital, within the last five years that incorporate anti-racist themes. We are searching for books within our collection that include three main components, racial diversity, topics related to social justice, and a focus on the geographic area of the US. Our intention is for this to provide us with a baseline on how these topics are represented in our collection for future comparison. The process we used uh, was developed in consultation with Melissa Gonzalez at the University of West Florida, who has previous experience in this area. So looking to the future, um, we're, we're thinking of organizing a focus group or town hall meeting with faculty and students who teach, learn, and conduct research in anti-racism to discuss their thoughts about current library resources and where there, there may be gaps. Uh, we want to examine how we can add other formats to the, to the collection to diversify the viewpoints, um, such as video, oral histories, or, or music. And we want to survey publishers and vendors to get a sense of what percent of published authors within the past three years are from the BIPOC community, or what is the BIPOC representation among senior executives or on the board of directors. So, you know, these are some of the activities that Binghamton University Libraries uh, is up to or plans to get into, but we're aware that the work that we do occurs within the broader ecosystem of the university, and we are ever mindful of that political context. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Curtis. That was a great segue to some of the more specific things libraries have available to the broader discussion we'll now get into. But quickly before that, our second poll. Similar to the first, for the question, how far along is your institution in creating and carrying out a plan to diversify your collections? Gauge your responses from we haven't started, 
to its fully integrated and well underway. So we'll go to pollev.com slash OCLC. The link is in the chat. And click again, and we can see that uh, lots of responses are coming in already. Uh, from we haven't gotten started to it's fully integrated and well underway. And again, we're seeing quite a few uh, responses that are headed towards the middle, some a little bit more towards we haven't gotten started yet. And it's great that everyone is here today, as we as we noted before. And one or two are fully saying they're fully great, integrated, and well underway. So it looks like everyone has had a chance to participate. And what we're going to do now is we're going to move into general discussion. And so we're going to open the, the, the conversation up to our panelists, and we're going to ask a few questions. And the first one is going to be, how does the library and campus leadership need to support this? And what are the preconditions that are necessary for success? Now, Curtis led us into this question, but we're opening it to the panel as a whole. How does the library and campus leadership need to support diversifying our collections and efforts? Is there someone who would like to start? Elizabeth, I can go. Um, okay, great. When I was thinking um, about this question and, and Helen and I discussed it at some length, um, in terms of collection assessment, um, I think the main thing is a commitment to using the results to inform decision making. So thinking particularly about the value metric tool, um, it does take a lot of time and effort to score products. So um, when we've been revising the tool, we were very intentional about making sure that the EDI metrics reflect our institutional and professional values. Um, and so moving forward, we want to make sure that we have support from leaders to make the to make decisions based on our findings. So uh, I'm speaking specifically about special collections here. Um, I think, uh, and this touches on some of the points that that Curtis made more broadly. Um, you know, I think leadership needs to be aware of power dynamics um, and the and real the reality of opportunity costs. Um, so, so with you know, special collections are um, used in a lot of different ways in the university, and and if we're going to change what kinds of collections we're we are bringing in and what um, and using the resources that we have. Uh, the finite resources that we have differently, that, that means we're going to say no to collections um, that we might traditionally have said yes to. And often uh, folks, when they are, are looking for an archive for their collections, sometimes they are powerful people, sometimes they are people with connections to the university, sometimes they're people with connection, their alumni, or they're, they're being courted by the development office, um, and, and perhaps aren't folks who are used to hearing no. Um, so uh, that is uh, um, supporting the kinds of, and, and you know, there are different reasons to take in collections and ultimately you'll decide what you need to decide for your institution, but, but I think people on the ground who are making these decisions and dealing every day with potential donors um, need the backup to say no and know that they'll, they'll largely be supported in saying no uh, or, or they will um, at least be able to have an informed conversation about uh, about that. Um, the other thing is that there are power dynamics internally around collecting and um, something that we're hearing a lot from people who have started to try to work within this framework is that um, you know there's a, especially places where there's a history of kind of over of collecting more than you had the resources to process and describe and catalog that there are some power dynamics between curatorial and technical services positions, public services positions. And when you're bringing together people in a new way to share information and sort of bring more people into a decision-making conversations, um, you may need to build some trust. Um, and so support for recognizing those power dynamics and support for, for that trust building. I think building that trust is a precondition for, the, for this to, to work well. It's important to have have as much support as you can possibly garner, but I think it's also important to recognize that not everyone is going to be supportive, and 
there will be powerful people in the organization or on campus who are opposed to what's taking place, to, what, to what's going on. And I think ultimately a lot of this comes down to you know, personal risk tolerance and the level of importance that one places on, on the work. I mean, for, for those working in collections, regardless of one's place in the library hierarchy, it's possible to take positive actions towards making the collections less racist or more diverse. It's, you know, some of it has to come down to how committed are you and how much are you willing to, to put, put at risk? Um, because people will be opposed to this. They may not come out and say, I'm opposed to it, but they have probably about a million ways of demonstrating their opposition. So, um, you know, it, it will be there. Thank you for that. Um, and that sort of leads into the, our next question of how well informed is the campus of your collection diversification programs? And what, if any, has been the response? I can start with that. So our education department, for example, uh, I mentioned earlier that we are undertaking an initiative uh, in looking at our juvenile collection, which is which one might think is really odd to be able to do, but when we were working with the in-service, uh, the teachers who were, the students who were going to become in-service teaching, doing their in-service teaching, it became really evident that even though we had good intentions of being fiscally responsible, um, that we were perhaps doing a disservice by uh, not collecting directly and relying upon collections of others, even though we appreciate consortial arrangements. So, you know, pushing with the educational faculty um, what it was we needed to do to um, increase and enhance our juvenile collection, uh, the response actually has been very positive. They have been very vocal about the necessity of having collections that are culturally inclusive. So um, that, that has been gratifying uh, to see that there are faculty out there who are willing to uh, not only uh, support the effort, but step up and provide resources and, and, and class time for us to talk with the students and help them develop the techniques. Um, over the past year, we've been able to add several new resources to our collection, uh, thanks to our state consortium Viva. And one product that comes to mind is the History Makers Digital Archive. Um, and we definitely marketed um, all of these new resources to faculty and students, and, and we have received a lot of positive feedback. Um, and it's clear from the usage statistics that faculty are incorporating these um, new resources into their courses, and students are making use um, of them for their assignment. So it, it's been a very positive experience for us. For us, the, the climate at, at Binghamton has been largely favorable and, and we the libraries have been doing a good bit of work over the last year and a half or so. The majority of our library faculty and staff came together as volunteers to form Binghamton Library's Anti-Racism Coalition Keepers or, or Black. Um, over a year ago to identify and combat instances of systemic racism within our libraries. Um, so I talked a little bit about some of the collections audit work that we've, we've been doing, um, but we've really been more public, I think, about our talent acquisition audit, where we're looking at a lot of our, our HR functions and some of the, the climate within, within the workplace here. So I think campus probably is a little bit more aware of some of the efforts that have been going on in, in that domain, more so than in, in the collections area. Okay, thank you. What resources have been devoted to and or support the efforts uh, of DEI in the collections? And how did you get started? We, um, uh, part of that, that, that uh, black group, one of the things that they did was to, to set up a pretty extensive resources page. And uh, I think we've probably put in about $5,000 or so, so far, uh, you know, in terms of adding things to our collections um, that were, you know, people identified as, as gaps or, or items that they would like to see added um, to build that, that page out. Uh, there's not a, a fixed budget for it. I mean, we're going to keep investing over time as, as we you know, need, need to, but um, 
Um, that's that's what the investment has been so far in on the collection side. Um, we've put about fifteen thousand dollars into the talent um, um, audit so far, and countless in, in innumerable um, amount of staff time. And people have been really hitting this pretty hard. I will say for Roanoke, um, we have had. Uh, and I'll talk from the institutional repository and special collection side because that truly for us was really the first intentional project. Uh, our systems librarian is very heavily devoted to creating uh, collections of diversity. And then he was the one who actually uh, reached out to work with the uh, new history faculty member uh, to develop the Southwest LGBTQ collection. Um, and so, you know, it has taken off from more than a library response as it relates to that. But he has also undertaken, um, Roanoke has recently begun to, to document uh, the contributions of enslaved labor to the building of the college. So what we are now doing in terms of our institutional repository and special collections is using it as a, um, I would say a, a beta, a beta project, creating beta projects um, to, to demonstrate how we can further provide research access to information about the building of the campuses, the historical significance of who, who helped to create the campus as it exists today. Um, but it really was a grassroots effort as far as uh, the resources that have been de devoted to and supporting the efforts. Um, and I, I'm quite happy to say that they were, they were intentionally um, designed projects where staff already had commitment, staff and faculty had commitment. So we're almost at 250. And what I would like to do is ask a magic wand question. And that is if you could wave the wand and there were no barriers in terms of staff resources, financial resources, what would you want for your collections? Go ahead, Summer. So um, I mostly worked on the accessibility metrics of the, evalu the value metric tool um, and as I said earlier in the presentation, we really view accessibility as a key component of inclusion. Um, so if I could wave a magic wand, I would make all of our e-resource platforms and content more accessible to all users. Um, I, you know, I, I think accessibility is an important component of EDI, and there's definitely still a lot of work that needs to be done to make our e-resources accessible to all users. So um, I find this question really interesting and, and really challenging, right? Because as Curtis and Chella were saying, um, we know that our collections were built by white people within institutions with really problematic racist histories. Um, and so a lot of us are looking for structural change, right? Transformative change. And it's not, it's hard to imagine a magic wand that could erase all that and hit a hard reset. Um, at the same time, if there were a way to take all of the collections that we have and redistribute the, I suppose, the authorship publishers, countries of origin in such a way that, that um, we magically erased the impact of that history. Um, that would be fascinating. Um, but as I said, um, it's hard to imagine a magic wand doing all of that work that will take so long and so much engagement. And I see in the response in the in the chat there there are a couple of people that have said as many primary sources as possible, and as inexpensively as possible, um, recognizing that you know there are libraries out there with diverse with uh, definitely different budgets. Um, what does success look like in this in the world in which we're talking about right now, Curtis? For me, um, success would, would be that uh, the, the BIPOC students on campus and the faculty feel like the library is their place, that it's the place they want to come to when they come there, they feel at home, that this is the, it's, it's a destination point for them, that, you know, this is the place they come and they want to hang out here, that, you know, this is, they feel comfortable there, you know, it's, it's again, it's, it's their place. 
I think that's why we've opened up the collaboration space in the way that we have, because it's an opportunity for students who are studying on that floor to to have the uh, happenstance opportunity to listen to the conversations, to engage in the conversations, as well as those that are deliberately attending. Um, you know, it is a comfortable, we hope, comfortable environment. Um, just by the fact of the comfortable furniture, it's their space. But in order for people to feel comfortable, they also have to feel like they can own the space. They can be a part of the space. So our collaboration space has very much become that for, for students and for faculty. Um, so um, when, when I think about what, what I want for our collections, um, I think, and I think this is true for Viva too, we want students from up underrepresented groups to be able to find themselves, see themselves in their experiences in the communities um, in the library's collections in a way that is meaningful to them. Um, for a university like George Mason, um, the student body is radically diverse on just about any axis, so that's actually quite high standard. Um, and then ultimately, um, I think that really requires that we get the students involved. And so one of the things we're, we're hoping to do at Mason to bring students into this process is actually run a collection assessment partly designed and implemented with students as, um, as co-researchers alongside us um, to really understand what it is that I'm saying when I say what do students want. Helen, I think you've actually segued us into our very last poll quite nicely. It's a great place to wrap up. I'd like to close with one more poll before we sign off. If the audience would let us know how excited you are to commit to practical steps to increase diversity in your library's collections, we're going to ask you to rate how you feel from not at all to totally enthusiastic. And we're going to watch as the markers bounce onto the continuum and oh this is a very different look which is good because we have progressed over the course of the afternoon conversation uh, we have some that are saying not at all and that's perfectly fine uh, to we have a large contingent of our audience now that's saying they're totally enthusiastic to begin um, committing to practical steps to increase diversity in the library's collections. Uh, and I think as I'm, it's an important topic and it really, I think our conversations and our responses have shown that there's a lot of work to do, but I'm glad we've taken some time today to look at specific tools and programs that can help to discuss and to discuss some of the challenges that we hope to have in this area. I'd like to thank Thank my, our other panelists, Summer, Helen, Curtis, and Shayla, and to OCLC for hosting this discussion. It's been really um, rewarding for me to participate. Thank you uh, for allowing me to participate and talk about what's happening at Roanoke. And I look forward to um, implementing some of the things that I've heard, particularly the EDI metrics tool. And, you know, Curtis has talked about the, the um, the audits that he, he has undergone at his institution. And I think the moderator from OCLC is going to have a few closing words at this point in time. I just want to say thank you to all of our speakers, and we really appreciate everyone who has been able to join us today. We have recorded this presentation, and we will send the recording next week. Additionally, we received a request for links, so we will be collecting some of those links and citations so that we can share out with those who registered. Thank you again and have a wonderful morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you're at. Thank you so much.